All right, well, it's so good to be here. I know I keep saying that, but man, it's been like a long, long eight weeks. And I want you to know, if you were unable to like track with us while we were online, uh, we noticed and felt your absence. Right? It wasn't just like we were all like, okay, finally, just all of us who have access to this. Uh, we were missing you. And so all the while while we were uh, in this online space, uh, we were asking this question of how do we get back? Uh, and when is it uh, wise to do this? Because uh, we're a church that is committed to this neighborhood. And so even as we weren't gathered here in person, I want you to know a lot of people who are here this morning uh, lived right down the block from you. Now, we were here in this neighborhood, and so we are committed to being here, uh, even when we have to get a little bit creative in this space. Uh, and if you weren't with us last week, we launched a series and really a theme that's going to take us uh, all the way through this year. We're going to dial in on this theme that we're calling Bless Your Block. Uh, and the idea behind this is this, that we have, in this past year, spent uh, an incredible amount of time local. Right? Uh, in previous years, maybe we, uh, we commuted to work to a different neighborhood, and, and a lot of people now are like dialing in or, or uh, are calling in to work. They're staying at home. Uh, schools used to be traveling to a building, but now we're staying in our homes and doing homework from home. Now, rather than going out to concerts or large restaurants, we are door dashing right, and getting stuff delivered to our home. So we are spending more time within one square mile than we have for a generation. And as we're seeing this happen, uh, it's really causing us or should cause us to ask this question of how do we follow Jesus within the one square mile of my house. This is the idea behind Bless Your Block, is what would it look like if we all got on board with following Jesus right with the people that are around us, right with our neighbors and the people that we, uh, we are, are on the same bus line with and the people who uh, walk to the same park as us? How do we live out the way of Jesus right here? Because a lot of times we, we drive somewhere uh, to follow Jesus and then we drive home. Right? We go to church somewhere else, and then we drive home. But if we are at home, what does it look like to live out the way of Jesus right here? And so Bless Your Block is all about this question of how we follow Jesus right where we live. And last week, we kicked this off by asking this really big question of what does God want? Like if God had a Christmas list, what would be at the top of that Christmas list? And we saw that the whole story of the Bible is really about this one idea, that God wants to bless the world through his presence. Now, this is what God is doing. He wants to bless the world through sharing himself with us. We saw that that's why he created everything. He created a world in which we could know him and interact with him. And when sin enters the world, we're separated from God, and the mission of God then becomes about getting us back to him through Jesus. And so as we celebrated at Christmas, this is God coming to us, sharing his presence with us. But then as he forms a new family called the church, his presence is now present in the church. And the church is then called to join him in this mission to bless the world through his presence by going out and sharing who he is. And so this idea of, of bless is an acronym that we've been using, five everyday simple things that you can do to join Jesus on his mission to bless the world, starting with the people who live right next door to you. And so it's an acronym BLESS. We've been talking about, uh, we'll be talking about these five things over the next, this week and next week. Uh, the B stands for being prayerfully present. We talked about this last week, of, of the importance of being both prayerful and present, of being prayerful, praying that God would open your eyes and your heart to the people that are around us, but then also being present to, to know what's going on and to understand the people who live here. We have to do both of those things. Today, we're going to talk about the next two letters. The L stands for listen. The E stands for eat. Listen and eat with people. We're going to look at how Jesus does that. And then next week, we're going to look at the last two S's of serving and sharing your story. These are five simple, everyday things that we can do to participate in the mission of Jesus right where we are. And if you're here and you say, I'm not a Christian, uh, that doesn't mean that this series is not for you. What I hope that this series offers you is to look at what it truly means to follow Jesus. What it truly looks like when you get serious about following Jesus. Because there's a lot of stereotypes about what Christianity is all about. There's a lot of assumptions about what Jesus is all about. But my hope is that as we look at who Jesus is and what Jesus does, you'll get to see what Christianity is actually all about. It's about this beautiful mission to bless the world through Jesus. So last week we looked at be prayerfully present. Today we're going to look at listening and eating. And we're going to look at what Jesus does and how he does this with people. Did you know that in the story of Jesus, Jesus actually has a reputation among religious people for being a glutton and a drunkard. 
This is actually recorded in the Gospels that, that the religious people of the day, they looked at Jesus and they saw him not as a serious religious character. They saw him as this guy who always is eating and drinking with people. And they say, you're a glutton and a drunkard. Why would anybody listen to you? But this is how significant this was to Jesus' time that he spent time eating and listening with people. And so this morning we're going to look at the first uh, account that we have of Jesus spending time with people around a table. And we're going to look at Mark chapter 2. So if you have a Bible with you, I invite you to follow along. I think we'll have it on the screen as well if our technical difficulties are working out. We'll see. Mark chapter 2, we're going to look at uh, verses 13 through 17. Mark is the second of the narratives of Jesus. It comes after Matthew and before Luke and John, if you are new to the Bible and wondering where you can find that. It is in the back third of the Bible, Mark chapter 2. This is what it says. He, that's Jesus, went out again beside the sea, and all the crowd was coming to him, and he was teaching them. And as he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, follow me. And he rose and followed him. And as he reclined at table in his house, many tax collectors and sinners were reclining with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. And the scribes of the Pharisees, when they saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, said to his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? And when Jesus heard it, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. This is God's word for us this morning. So get this picture. Jesus at this time, this is like he is rising in fame. People are starting to talk about him. He's, he's going viral, we would call this today. He is getting some notoriety. And he's got lots of people who are following him, people who are interested in what he is doing. And John tells us, in, or sorry, Mark tells us in only the second chapter of his story that he's got a crowd around him. But I want you to see that what Jesus does while he has this crowd around him is he zeroes in on one character, this character, Levi. And Mark tells us a few details about his life, but it's enough to tell us the kind of character that Levi is. Levi is a tax collector. Now, this is not like your IRS block agent, right, where you're like, okay, tax season's coming up. You go to him, and he helps you figure out your problems. To be a tax collector in that day was to be a political traitor. You see, Levi was Jewish. We know this by nature of his name. That he grew up uh, as a member of the people of Israel. He was a Jewish person by birth. But the fact that he's a tax collector means that he has now aligned himself with Rome. Rome was occupying Israel at the time. And so Levi decided at some point in his life he was going to reject the faith and the people of his birth. And he was instead going to align himself with the opposing political party. And so he was known as a political traitor. But tax collectors in that day were also known as morally questionable kinds of characters. Because you see, there wasn't as much checks and balances on the tax system. And so Levi could go to people and he could say, hey, your taxes are actually $40 when really Rome is looking for $30. And so that extra $10 that he could think is like, this is my finder's fee. And so tax collectors were known as being deceptive, morally questionable kinds of characters. And even as we see, Levi, he throws a party at his house, and he gathers other morally questionable kinds of characters. And so Jesus has this crowd of people who are listening to him. And he says, there's Levi. And notice what he says. He says, follow me. He says to Levi, follow me. Anytime Jesus looks at a character in one of the stories and he says, follow me, he is inviting that person to become a disciple. Now, a disciple is kind of a churchy word that gets thrown around a lot, but a disciple is someone who learns from and lives, from, or lives out the way of Jesus. Someone who follows Jesus and learns what he does and is associated with Jesus and then lives out what Jesus teaches that person. And so Jesus looks at Levi, this political traitor, this morally questionable guy, and he says, I want you to be my disciple. I want you to follow me. You see, this means for you, if you're thinking, you know, okay, there's certain boxes that I have to check in order to become a Christian, right? There's certain uh, categories that I have to meet in order to be considered a Christian. I have to be of the right political persuasion. 
I have to be a, generally a moral kind of person. I can't have too much baggage in my background. I have to look like I fit in. I have to look like I belong. I have to learn a certain set of Christian language. If those are the things that you think a Christian is about, Jesus doesn't even understand those things. He looks at Levi, the political traitor and the morally questionable guy, and he says, follow me. So wherever you are this morning, maybe you're thinking, I'm not a Christian because it feels like I have to fit in these boxes. It feels like I have to fit in the box of the political thing or the, the language thing or the behavior thing or the moral thing. Jesus instead looks at Levi and he looks at you and he says, follow me. There are no prerequisites to following him. And I want you to notice what Jesus does with Levi next. Jesus looks at Levi, he says, follow me. Levi does, and Jesus takes him to his own house and he says, throw a party. And he gathers all of his friends together. And it is a party with tax collectors and sinners, people who are, who are known to be morally questionable kinds of characters. I want you to imagine if instead of this, Jesus had said, Levi, follow me. And then he invited Levi uh, to a six-week six week confirmation class where every day he was, he was studying the Bible, he was learning deep theology, and then even that, Jesus said, okay, follow me, go to seminary. And then he spent three years in seminary, he learned all of the deep theology of Christianity, he learned how to study the Bible as deeply as he possibly could, he got over his stealing and his sin. And then three years later, he comes back to his friends, and maybe he's even wearing khakis and a tie, and he says, hey guys, let me tell you about Jesus. Jesus. What impact would he have on his friends in that moment? You see, Jesus calls Levi at the tax booth, the symbol of his morally questionable nature, the symbol of his political traitorness. He calls him to follow him, and right then and there, Jesus says, okay, I want you to go get your friends and bring them to me, and we're going to throw a party. You see, Levi has the most significant impact he could ever have on his friends the day that he starts following Jesus. Because if he went to seminary for three years and came back in khakis and a tie and then said, hey guys, let me tell you about Jesus, they'd be like, Levi, you don't know anything about us. You've been gone for three years. You don't even look like you used to look. Is that what it means to be a Christian, to, to wear khakis and a tie, to, to go off to school and be totally disconnected with the world? But because Levi, they knew Levi yesterday. They knew what he said yesterday. They knew what he embezzled yesterday. They knew the language that he used yesterday because they knew him yesterday and because today he is following Jesus and inviting them to the party. They see Levi, this Jesus did something. This Jesus transformed you and he can tell them about who he is. Now, he probably doesn't have all, everything figured out. He doesn't have all the language and he can't lead them in a deep Bible study, but he can tell them about who Jesus is. And so if you're here and you're thinking, man, I, I'm not ready to talk about Jesus with people. You know, I don't have all the questions answered. I don't have the, the, the theology figured out. I can't lead a Bible study. Look at Levi from the tax booth where he is practicing his political traitorness, his, his morally questionable nature. He meets Jesus, and that night his friends come to Jesus. And so you don't have to go through long, extensive classes to be able to be a witness and to bless your neighbors with the presence of Jesus. You just have to be like Levi. And when Jesus says, follow me, he says, throw a party and invite your neighbors, and invite the sinners to come over, you do it. And when you do that, you will have a far more, far greater impact on the people around you than if you carted off to seminary and came back in khakis and a tie and said, let me tell you about Jesus. This is who Levi is, and this is who you can be. And this is who Jesus is calling us to be. But I want you to notice what happens next. Jesus is in the middle of this group of sinners and tax collectors. Now, when Mark says that, when he uses that language, he's saying these people have a reputation. These are the people that are known to be people that you avoid. And the religious people, they get their, uh, they're, they're all just kind of messed up by what Jesus is doing here. They say, Jesus, how can you do that? How can you associate with those people? Don't you realize you're getting a reputation? Don't you realize you're making uh, the way of, of God look bad? And Jesus says to them, he says, I have come not to call the righteous, but sinners. You see, Jesus sums up his entire mission. The entire reason why he came is summed up in what he does in this passage. He says, I have come to invite 
sinners to dinner with me. Because you see, in that day and age, when you were invited to a dinner table, it wasn't just like you're being polite. It was an invitation to community. It was an invitation to be known and identified with the people who were there. So everyone there, Jesus is saying, these are my people. I am welcoming you. I want to know your story. I want to know who you are. I want to know, uh, I want to be identified with you. That's what Jesus is saying when he invites these folks to dinner. Jesus says, my entire mission is summed up in this picture that I am inviting sinners to dinner. I want you to notice two things that Jesus does here. The first is this. Jesus does not uh, ignore their sin. Jesus doesn't ignore their sin. Now, he doesn't look to the religious people and say, uh, you call these things sin. I actually disagree with you. I don't think that those things are sin. Jesus does not, doesn't do that. He says, I've come to call sinners. Right? So he's not, he's not kind of uh, just relativizing everything and saying, well, this doesn't really matter. He still believes that they have some morally questionable things that need to be dealt with. He just knows that the way that they're going to deal with them is not through their own trying, but through him. So he doesn't minimize or ignore their sin. But the second thing is this. He actually invites the religious people to dinner too. You see, that last thing that Jesus says, you could read that as an invitation. See, the religious people are there, and they're looking in at this party, and they're saying, Jesus, how could you associate with those people? Don't you know what they've done? Don't you know their reputation? Don't you know how that makes you look? And Jesus says, my whole mission is this. I've come to invite sinners to dinner. And he says, I have come not to call the righteous, but sinners. And you have to believe that if any one of those religious people in that moment, if they were able to admit their need, they were able to admit their need that, yeah, I actually am a sinner, that, that behind all of my religious performance and my khakis and a tie and my education, I'm actually a sinner. I have a need too. Jesus would say, hey, here's a seat at the table. But you see, they have all kinds of religious reasons for why they don't do it. All kinds of religious reasons, all kinds of seemingly good reasons for why they don't join Jesus there. They have good excuses. And say, if I go eat dinner with them, what will people think? I mean, I know what's in my glass, but no one else knows what's in my glass. Right? They might think, man, my reputation could be ruined. They might think something might happen at this dinner table that then might make me unclean. So tomorrow when I go to church, God isn't going to love me. He's not going to accept me. They have all kinds of religious rationale for why they don't spend time with sinners and tax collectors. But Jesus is saying, if you would simply admit your need, acknowledge that you too are sick, you would be invited here. You see, I think the reason why Jesus spends time with tax collectors and sinners, why he says, these are my people, is because it is far easier for someone who is told every day that they are a sinner to acknowledge that they are a sinner than for someone who has a whole life and career built around looking good to then admit that they don't have it all together. Jesus says, these are my people. Because I don't have to convince them, I don't have to show them their need they wear it on their sleeves. And so when I offer them grace, they are ready to receive it. Because you see, the invitation to this table is based on Jesus' grace. He doesn't downplay the sin of the sinners that are there, but he also doesn't play the religious game of the relig- religious people who are there. He says, the invitation to this table is open to all those who would admit their need and then receive my grace. And grace means this, that nothing is earned and everything is given. That Jesus takes care of everything that we need. See, Jesus' whole purpose is to invite sinners to dinner. And so if you're here and you think, man, I, I wouldn't be invited, I want you to know if you admit your need, if you are able to own your sin, Jesus says, here's a seat. Now receive my grace. But for those of us who have been maybe in religious circles for a long time, it becomes really easy to justify and rationalize why we don't spend more time around the table with sinners and tax collectors. I think there's a lot of reasons why we don't do this. One is our time. We spend, it's so easy to spend so much of our time with other Christians, with other people who, who look like us and act like us and believe like us. And before long, you get into a church and and you're involved in the programs and then every night of the week is filled up and so there's no time and no availability in your schedule to be of any good to the people that live right around you. Because all they see is you carting the family off to another church program. So we have to prioritize our time around spending time with people 
that Jesus spent time with, the tax collectors and sinners. The other reason, I think, is we get really comfortable. It can be uncomfortable to cross the street or to cross the, the picket fence line, right? or to go into the restaurants and the, the, the places in our neighborhood that we like to avoid. As long as we value our comfort, we only invite people to dinner that we know and that we know won't disagree with us. Because if we spend time with tax collectors and sinners, think about it. I mean, what kind of topics are going to come up? What kind of disagreements are going to come up? What kind of drinks are going to be served or food is going to be served? What, it may, what if it makes me really uncomfortable? And so as long as we say, well, this is my time and this is my comfort, we will never follow Jesus as he is in the middle of our neighborhood gathered around tax collectors and sinners. But if we truly want to learn from and live out the way of Jesus, we have to follow him into those places, to those people. And some of them live right next door to you. You know it and you try to avoid them. I know it's awkward to live next to people sometimes. But those are the very people that Jesus wants you to bless. The people who are rough around the edges, just like Levi was. Because you might be living next to a Levi. Think about that. You might be living next to a Levi who, when you invite them to dinner, they might bring a whole host of people who, in turn, come to know who Jesus is. And so if we're going to be serious about blessing our block, about following Jesus, we are following a Jesus who invites sinners to dinner. And here's the thing. That's good news. Because if he didn't invite sinners to dinner, you and I wouldn't be invited. And it's only because he does this that we are welcome too. You see, this is why as a church, one of the central things that we do together is we practice communion. Because this is the first dinner, the first meal that Jesus has gathered around. But the end of the story, Jesus is gathered around another table. And there is another cup, there is another meal that is served. And that table is full of people from different backgrounds. Levi was there. I mean, there were religious conservatives and, and political revolutionaries gathered around this table that Jesus had called them together. Even Judas, who was going to betray him, was there. And Jesus took bread and he broke it and said, this is my body, this is my grace given to you. So take it and eat it. And he took a cup and he said, this is my blood poured out for you, my grace, so that you can know that you are always welcome at this table. And so in a moment, we're going to take communion together. And if you don't have a, uh, a cup, there are some available in the back. But if you're here and you'd say, I came in here thinking I'm not a Christian, that, uh, that I don't fit the box, I don't check all the boxes, I want you to see that Jesus is inviting you, especially you, to join him at dinner. You see, we believe that communion, this taking this bread and drinking this cup, it represents this communion, this dinner that we have with Jesus. And so as we take these things, we are saying, Jesus, I'm admitting my need and receiving your grace. And maybe for you, for the very first time, as we take communion, you could take this as a picture, as an outward symbol of the inner reality that is going on, that you are saying, Jesus, I need you. I'm ready to receive your grace. And if you're ready to do that, we invite you to join us at this table. For those of us who do follow Jesus, as we partake of these things, this pictures the fact that we are still sinners apart from Jesus. That we need the same thing that everyone else does, which is his grace. And as we take this bread and drink this cup, we are admitting our need, confessing our sin, and receiving from Jesus the grace and forgiveness that he came to bring us. And so in a moment, I'm going to pray for us. And when I uh, conclude this prayer, we're going to take these elements together. And then Jordan's going to come and lead us in uh, worship to this Jesus who invites sinners to dinner. So let me pray for us in this moment. Jesus, every single one of us is like Levi, political traitor, morally questionable, hiding a secret life, and yet you see us and you say, follow me. And so, God, for the one who is here who says, man, I don't, I don't check those boxes. I don't, I don't fit the categories. May they see the grace that you give Levi. It says, follow me, and he does. And you turn him into this disciple that invites his friends to dinner. So, God, as we take this communion together, this bread representing your body and this cup representing your blood poured out for us, would it be a reminder to us that we need your grace? 
And that is only by your grace that we are invited to this dinner. And that when we receive it, we are always invited. That seat is always open for us. So as we take these elements, would you uh, work out that reality in our hearts and our minds and our hands and our feet so that we would follow you as you live out this mission to invite sinners to dinner. And pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.